Alrighty, hello every folks, and good morning! Uh, welcome to a video I've been talking about doing for a while. Uh, sorry this took so long to get to. It, it's just one of those topics that you kind of got to be inspired for that day, you know? And yesterday I was sitting around, uh, you know, kind of sitting, uh, waiting between stuff at work, and then just started kind of noting down a list of uh, different things that uh, kind of both of these versions of this game did that I just kind of thought were neat. So let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and give this a little bit of a shot here. Um, so this is going to be covering a few topics. Uh, namely, uh, the kinds of uh, situations where both Reborn and One Vision basically saw the same topic and basically tried to fix it in totally different ways. Um, and on top of that, uh, just, uh, just kind of ways that you can kind of translate One Vision builds to uh, Reborn and stuff like that, because I think there's still kind of a little bit of that uh, kind of a mental situation going on out there where folks just assume that because stuff is no longer on one class that it's just gone completely rather than somewhere else. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, maybe this can help bring them folks together, as it were. Uh, I have no idea. Maybe it'll just sound like the ravings of a madman like usual, but let's go ahead and give this a bit of a shot. So, uh, in kind of relative summary here, when it comes to Reborn versus One Vision and whatnot, we'll get to the quality of life stuff later, but um, generally, when it comes to Reborn, there's more of a focus on fluidity and adaptability between your units, uh, where basically there's a lower amount of skills that do more depending on the situation, uh, whereas in uh, the One Vision side of things, it's more about uh, strategy in the moment. Um, and I wanted to go into a lot of these approaches beyond just the surface level, because it's always that surface level uh, kind of assessment that leads to, uh, to confusion, to a lot of hot takes on you know one version or the other. I've kind of seen it uh, go both ways at different times. Um, but again, they tried to do entirely different things, that uh, Reborn wanted to bring more people into the series to basically show them, like, look, we put so many mechanics in here, here's a bunch of stuff that nobody tried in the previous versions, give them a shot, they're pretty good, actually, and then in One Vision, they basically did the same thing, but they're also like, okay, let's take them in their current form and then just, like, add more features to them. So... Anyways, point being, one is about accessibility, one is uh, essentially about complexity, but both have complexity, so it's really difficult to actually say, you know, definitively one or the other kind of situation. Again, as I said before, for most folks I would recommend Reborn, One Vision is a completely different vibe to it, <laughs> so let's just go ahead and get into it here. So, to begin with, uh, let's go ahead and discuss uh, one, of the, one of those kind of interesting... I guess, would it be a dichotomy? I guess we'll call it a dichotomy. Um, uh, between uh, the different classes, like where essentially one class is being used to support the actions of another class in a particular way. Uh, so in this particular case, believe it or not, we're actually going to be comparing the Shaman and the Rogue. So in One Vision early on, uh, Sarah actually comes in as a Rogue. Uh, this is a class that's not in Reborn. Basically, it is a essentially a class that's built around stealing consumables and laying down traps. These are both mechanics that basically didn't really get much love in the PSP version. Um, they had a lot of mechanics to them, technically, but, like, the, in general, it was clearly one of these, like, kind of half-drunk, we put it in on, like, one weekend before release kind of features. Namely because the steel feature back in the original just had nothing to use it for, really. Like, there were a few rare instances, like, if you wanted to get more Knight Commander marks for Ozma rather than you know, doing the Reborn approach of just going and fighting more bosses, or even the One Vision approach of just going to fight more bosses, they're like, you need to go track down some Templars, specifically after their castle has been taken over, so that a few of them are sad and zombified and hanging out in the rain, and then if you have rank 3 or higher, you can occasionally steal a uh, Knight Commander mark from them. It's like, why is it over there? <laughs> Like, that's so inconvenient, and who the hell's gonna try to go for that one specific map in the middle of the rain, and then you're there trying to make make it into the rainy season so that you can make a rainy map spawn, so that you can make that random encounter happen. Like, there was all of this little, like, almost MMO-esque, we put it in there in the hopes that somebody will find it in a single-player game that most folks just kind of blitz through. <laughs> so, anyway... So, to get into this whole thing here, uh, in the, on the One Vision side of things, uh, one of the things that you'll often end up stealing uh, when it comes to the Rogue, uh, one of the items that they ended up redoing, is actually these uh, uh, these uh, Crystallos uh, Ore over here. So, the uh, the Crystallos Ore. So, these are an item that, back in the original, were just used for crafting. Essentially, uh, you, these were just one of the steps uh, for making orbs or shots. In the original version, there was little reason to actually worry about these whatsoever. They were a thing that you made... You essentially took your balder, 
uh, you turned it into Crystalos, and then you took your, your Crystalos, you turned it into an elemental version, and then you turned it into the orbs. And the main idea behind this little transformation there was that it, it was kind of giving you several layers of potential failure to what would otherwise be an infinite money farm uh, that you could just do from the shop at extreme tedium as your cost. <laughs> It was very strange, but anyway, uh, both versions decided to approach this whole idea in very different ways. So they took this Crystalos idea, right? And so they basically said, in like in one vision's case, they're like, okay, this is an item that you can craft, yes, but this is something that will that will oftentimes be carried on units, which means that early on you can oftentimes go nab some of these in order to create an instill effect. So the instill effect is going to be. In, you know, in the original PSP and uh, One Vision's case, 25% uh, uh, damage bonus on top of a physical attack. So essentially, uh, this causes that attack to be able to train the augments of that element, which is something you had to do in the PSP version. Um, so they're able to train that element uh, temporarily, and they're also able to, uh, uh, to now get that little bit of a damage bonus when they're going and attacking with it. And so... Basically, what you're doing here is you're creating this, uh, this little thing where the rogue is able to support another unit uh, by going and essentially upgrading their attacks with these uh, these crystal items. So they're training their steel skill, they're taking these crystal items, they're now interacting with another class. Like, let's say you hand it over to a rune fencer or something who has an inbuilt throw ability, um, and then, like, let's say, you know, this guy is just kind of standing around. Let's go ahead and show them right here. Actually, there's no way I'm going to be able to show it. Uh, both Rune Fencers and Warlocks in the original here are considered item specialists. Or, I say original, in one vision here. Are, are considered item specialists, so they will be able to throw items. So they would go throw that uh, buff onto somebody. And, you know, now you have two different classes interacting in an unusual way. So if you see, for example, that there's a, you know, an archer that has a clean shot that wouldn't quite have enough damage more than likely to finish somebody off, you would essentially step in with your fencer, be like, hey, you know, this rogue stole this uh, crystal earlier, let me just go ahead and load it up onto this archer, fire into the back row, there you go, 25% extra bonus damage, and it'll take advantage of your augment. You know, all well and neat, nice little interaction there. So, they have that same interaction that, uh, that's done in a different way uh, here in Reborn. Now, it's going to take fewer steps to explain, you'll see this as a kind of general running theme that everything will typically take fewer steps to explain. Uh, let's see, who do we want to switch over to a Shaman, actually? Uh, you know what, I think we will temporarily take our uh, Terra Knight and switch her over, because everyone seems to consider Sherry the, like, canon Shaman type situation. Um, it, for reference, by the way, every uh, Shaman that I've uh, used on this file has accidentally gone the way of the Dodo. Anyway, so, we'll go ahead and uh, switch her over real quick. And then we'll see that they have these uh, resonance abilities. And so, by themselves, like, usually when you see folks uh, going and using shamans, they typically will uh, will be doing doing these cases where they'll just be focusing on, like, Oh, God, I gotta use summons all the time, you guys! Damage, damage, DPS, oh my God! Um, so, uh, instead of that, also, they actually are a pretty decent team player here, uh, where they've got a lot of resonance abilities. Now, there are other other units that are able to give instills to your team. For example, early on, the Vartan uh, has their, uh, I think it was Hel either Alcolas or Hobongo, uh, that will give them an instill ability that they can throw onto their teammates, uh, which will give them that 25% damage effect, which makes them good for that early on. However, uh, in this particular case, if you wanted to take advantage of one of the new features uh, for Reborn, uh, where the instills are basically a lot more kind of tilted in the form of, um, of kind of uh, how they interact with the person's element in question. Uh, so, for example, like, let's say you had a Fire Archer with a Brimstone Bow, uh, the one to take advantage of that anatomy bonus, you might be able to get up to 30% of a bonus uh, by going and uh, using a uh, Blazing Resonance nearby them. Uh, creating a situation that the uh, Shaman could essentially open up uh, and potentially finish off with a Longbow, or potentially give a uh, Elemental uh, kind of uh, affinity to a uh, Fusilier or something along those lines. So you're basically still taking the same idea of, you know, this class has this uh, potential buff that they can throw onto somebody else, but can't really make a whole lot of use of themselves, and then you're just applying it from a different location. Instead of, let's say, Rogue to Fencer to, uh, uh, to Archer or what have you, or, you know, any other ranged unit, instead it ends up being the, uh, the Shaman that ends up, uh, ends up throwing it on there and, you know, potentially helping out in that way. There's going to be a lot of these little shifts between different classes, and this is part of the reason that uh, you'll occasionally see comments over, like, just like calling the, um, calling, like, analyzing all this stuff uh, mental gymnastics. It's not gymnastics. So mental gymnastics is when you need to severely twist something 
to go and you know, to, to go make any sense of it whatsoever. Um, those are those cases where you see somebody going and trying to throw a religious argument on basically everything. In this particular case, it's as simple as, here is thing, it got moved over here. Like, this is the same kind of thing I've been saying since launch that uh, uh, the uh, Resident Evil remake did uh, back in the day, where essentially they took a lot of the stuff that was expected, and then they took it out, pissed people off, and then, you know, ended up bringing it back in a satisfying way. All right, so let's... Let's go ahead and move on to other things, because this is actually a pretty long list, and I have gotten on another tangent! What a shocker. Alright, so, uh, next up, let's go ahead and talk about light longbows. Uh, so this is actually another thing that, uh, uh, that you see, you know, brought up every now and then over the, uh, the shortbow, longbow type of situations, uh, that got updated for OV. And so basically the way that they changed, um, uh, changed bow access, uh, because both of them agreed that uh, uh, that bows needed more access. It was simply a weird situation where long bows were strictly the archer thing, um, except for the ranger and the lord. Um, so few units got to use them, but they were also really, really kind of overpowered for many situations, kinda, uh, back in PSP. So it was this case of this weapon that few classes could make use of. Um, it tended to make it uh, feel very narrow in terms of your options for, like, optimizing uh, optimizing a win, you know? Um, also, I just noticed, hang on, I have these sized a little bit wrong. You know, where do I have this thing? I, I just noticed the picture at the bottom makes it, I've made it slightly smaller, and one of the things goes a little bit over uh, <laughs> where this GIF is, and it makes it look, look like it's flashing. Sorry about that. Anyway, so as far as long bows go, uh, as far as short bows go, they wanted to widen out access in both situations. So, like, let's say in one vision, you've got situations where, like, the long bow is available for the familiar um, on top of the archer, which might seem kind of strange, but I feel like this was probably more of a Knight of Lotus thing, because, like, throwing long bows on your fairies was a pretty funny thing you could do in that one. Anyway. So, uh, you do have uh, access to, uh, to more longbows and things like, uh, like this here, but you also have more reasons to use shortbows. Where, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the shortbow and, you know, single weapon uh, skirmisher is a build that the game has been trying to push since the SNES. It's this idea of this, you know, kind of unit carrying around multiple weapons rather than fancy abilities or what have you. And it feels very good to pull off. However, it's varied in terms of its usefulness. It worked in SNES because there were no skills to rank up. There were no... Like, it basically was just the unit's stats and then a slight preference toward their preferred weapon. Uh, by the end, uh, they could potentially have access to, let's say, one finisher move uh, if they completed Palace of the Dead. But even then, it was a maybe, right? So either way, though, uh, because it was primarily running off of stats, having access to a short bow and single weapon build, uh, you know, again, skirmisher from here on out, is something that was viable, uh, because in many cases, a lot of your frontliners had a tendency to end up being this anyway, uh, because your, the main purpose of your frontliners back in SNES was more of a deterrent. Uh, it was essentially a case of whoever attacks loses, uh, because whoever uh, swings first gets counterattacked, and then they get finished off by that unit's buddies. Uh, whereas uh, if you were uh, to, let's say, just go in, fire a bow, and then, you know, wait to uh, to inflict your counterattack, it gave you the best of both worlds. Now, they tried to bring this back temporarily for PSP. It didn't go terribly well, uh, because in PSP, uh, everything was reliant on ranks, and ranks are really, really, really powerful for PSP. Um, so we're talking about a situation where, in, in the PSP version, if a unit was not fully ranked up in, let's say, both the melee weapon and the ranged weapon, they simply put would just be behind. They would be bl uh, planking off armor, they would have a very hard time, um, and they just wouldn't be able to keep up with how slow the training rates were. So it was very unlikely that somebody would bother doing that, because effectively you're taking one unit, you're giving them slightly more versatility at the cost of like, essentially double the training time. Um, and you would just be grinding in fights over and over to get those skill ranks up. So, the way that One Vision addressed this is essentially just speeding up those, uh, those skill ranks. Now, granted, this doesn't mean that they're flying off the shelves, either. <laughs> I should point out that, uh, right now, like, in this particular save file, I was, I was going and doing another, uh, another playthrough here to re-familiarize after all of the many, many changes that ended up happening here. And even still, it generally, uh, while I love using skirmisher builds, I have not found myself uh, using them that much this time around, 
Simply put, just due to training time. Uh, that takes quite a while to effectively make one. So normally it would end up coming to uh, something along the lines of like, let's say we got this guy here. Uh, they would train up one weapon and then later on you would give them better armor and then switch them over to a ranged weapon in order to uh, to make something happen. Uh, I know nine times out of ten I end up running uh, Canopus here as a... Uh, uh, as a uh, skirmisher, but this time around, I wasn't really particularly feeling it, uh, so I ended up switching him over to uh, uh, to just uh, slowing axe and uh, and spells for this one. Um, though I will say, uh, it's still always uh, always funny to me to have a build like this, uh, where it, it it's wildly impractical, but essentially uh, a uh, melee axe and throwing axes. It's wild, widely impractical, or wildly rather impractical, simply because of how friggin' much it weighs. But <laughs> anyway, I just find it funny. Okay, um, so either way, uh, even in this situation where uh, short bows have been given a lot of love, uh, they essentially upgraded the uh, the short bows in One Vision to the point where they are basically on par with their longbow variants. Uh, for pretty much the whole way through, however, they don't get access to elemental versions. Now, the funny part is, in Reborn, they basically went the total opposite version, uh, where in many ways they're kind of the... Um... Here, I just noticed I can still use the controller without switching between different windows here. Uh, where essentially they get access to the elemental uh, uh, bows from before, they're just made one-handed now. Now, in this particular case, I just want to point out for the millionth time here, how neat of a thing this is build-wise, because essentially they've packaged up multiple different things, and this is something the Reborn loves to do, where basically instead of just adding more stuff to the pile, they just packaged up multiple things. So like, the, uh, you notice throughout the game that the regular bows have a counter-attack on there. This isn't very practical, but this is more for aesthetic reasons. Uh, simply put, most of the archers in PSP will have counter-attack on there to fire back at your own units, and well, this leads to uh, to these bows having a counterattack effect on there too, um, basically just still allowing them to fire back, but also creating a funny situation where they'll always counterpunch uh, if they're ever melee attacked. Now that said, this also means that when they uh, took some of the redundant stuff, so one of the things that Reborn loved to do was take redundant stuff and basically axe it in the form of something else. Um, so in the case of let's say uh, the X Camillies, uh, you had. Here, let's go ahead and look over the bows real quick here. Uh, let's go ahead and sort these uh, based on default. And actually, let me go ahead and switch over windows so I can see it a little bit clearer here. But uh, the way that this used to work is you had a pretty straight progression back in PSP. You went to Crescent to Cupido. Um, truth be told, uh, Permafrost to Ix Camillies. Like, there was no reason to ever use a Permafrost because the Ix Camillies was just broken by comparison. It was like, would you like to have ice element on your bow and a little bit more damage, or would you like to have basically guaranteed shutdown on all of your shots? Like, I don't know, one of these is more than slightly better, I think, sir. Um, anyway, point being, the upgraded bows were stupidly powerful compared to their standard variants. There was a multi-part problem that this created. Uh, for one thing, you had to get all of your uh, endgame bows. All of them were drops. Um, you couldn't just uh, go into uh, into the end game, um, kind of picking and choosing what bows you got. You just basically got what you got, and there's a pretty reasonable uh, chance that you never got the majority of the bows. So uh, there was there was mostly a situation where the X Camillies kind of became the standard on account of not only having a debuff associated with it, uh, where it would shackle on hit. Uh, for those that haven't played PSP before, um, think of it in a Final Fantasy tactic sort of sense, where it basically turned off abilities. So you couldn't act, it was just don't act for all intents and purposes, except every time you turned on Tremendous Shot or uh, Eagle Eye. Nobody used Eagle Eye in PSP, but, you know, to, uh, to reference for the Reborn fans here. Um, basically, every time you had a guaranteed debuff shot, uh, the X Camillies would entirely disable that unit. So. Yes, very, very strong. This is, it's not a shocker that got taken out. <laughs> I don't know who thought... Okay, there were a lot of weird longbow decisions, actually, even going back to the SNES, because back on the SNES, the original debuffs were like, one of them petrified on hit, uh, one of them charmed on hit, uh, one of them was, uh, what was it? I think it was confusion on hit or something. Uh, confusion isn't a debuff that's around anymore. Um, anyway, point being, it was pretty busted. So at this point, what they had decided was that they took the re like kind of redundant variants. Uh, so like the crafted variants became a one-handed version with a counterattack effect, meaning that they were there specifically to boost up endgame uh, skirmisher builds here. 
So like earlier on, you might have somebody that went like sword and shield, and then later on you started realizing like, okay, their stats are good enough to forego the shield in favor of a second weapon. And then you hopefully have picked up by the on the elemental system at that point, essentially further solidifying how good this uh, this is as an idea, because effectively you now have like five different attacks here that could potentially give you, you know, a massive 30% bonus on top of already having a massive attack bonus. Essentially, just, you have your fire blasts and hyper beams for all of your different situations, you know? Um, you have your, your big Pokemon moves, you have your earthquakes and what have you. Uh, for anyone that's never played competitor, or played or watched competitive Pokemon before, Basically, there's a thing there where you essentially take your kind of chassis unit, as it were, and you try to give them coverage to cover their weaknesses. So, like, in this case, um, uh, in this case, this particular guy um, is built in such a way where his personal, um, his personal element is ice, meaning that using this ice bow will, uh, will ignore its 15% bonus here and effectively give him 40% against air units, but then plus 10% against everything else because he's matching it. However, this uh, axe over here, if he hits a earth unit with it, would give him a 16% bonus, but also unlocks his finishers over here. Um, now, in his particular case, he was being used for auto teams, so he's got Steadfast on there, but more than likely, if playing manual, would probably put something like Repel Beast or Repel Dragon on there in order to make it so that uh, he basically just becomes invincible versus that particular type of unit. Um, but then, effectively, these are... Uh, are several different elemental punishes. Again, I'm assuming I'm talking to both groups here. I'm assuming everyone understands how the whole uh, like elemental punish system works. Um, we'll cover that in, uh, on the element section in just a moment. But I just wanted to point out that uh, when it came to the short bow, effectively we're looking at it didn't just unlock the skill. It didn't require any specifically extra training. Like he went through a few uh, extra fights just using bows. But we didn't have to stop the tempo of the game in any way in order to switch him over from axe and shield to bow and axe. Like, he just, like, passively trained this up over the course of his uh, several fights there, and we didn't have to stop to do anything. There was the option to stop and do things in training mode, but we didn't, like, the, the whole point was that the pace kept on going. Everything about Reborn's idea is to keep the pace going. Uh, on One Vision's approach, it's to give you more options. So, like, if we go over to uh, the One Vision side here, we then go ahead and take a look at uh, the other stuff that was implemented around it. So, for example, the trick arrows that previously were exclusive to archers uh, also, or sorry, exclusive to ninjas also became available on the archers. So if you want your uh, numbing and silencing arrows, you have them here. However, the poisonous arrows are, well, the poisonous ranged attacks are still exclusive to the ninja. Uh, actually, due to technical shenanigans, uh, there actually isn't a uh, scroll uh, for uh, uh, for uh, putting in venom onto your shots. Instead, the ninjas uh, get a poisoned uh, a shuriken as their ranged attack. Uh, so essentially, if they don't have a ranged weapon, they can just throw out a, a shuriken there uh, that has a poison effect on there. And so this actually me uh, means that there's a, uh, a good little uh, teamwork here between a um, an archer and a ninja. Uh, where, for example, the archer, instead of uh, having access to poisoned arrows, would have access to, uh, to Eagle Eye over here. Um, or not Eagle Eye, where was it? Uh, where's Sure Shot? Uh, actually... Right, that's on the rogue now. Hang on, sorry, sorry. Again, stuff moved around. This is why I'm doing a refresher run. Um, okay, that's what I was using earlier. So, where is Sure Shot at? Uh, there we go, Bullseye. So, like, you've got uh, Bullseye over here on your Rogue. Essentially, you stick your Rogue next to your Ninja. That uh, that Sure Shot guarantees the uh, debuff on the Shuriken, which means you now have a basically guaranteed throwing dagger to guaranteed poison something. It's a few extra steps to achieve the same thing, but it's a cool feeling to be able to pull it off. Uh, ninja's got a lot of movement. Essentially, they sneak in there. They throw their uh, uh, they throw their uh, throwing dagger. Feels good to achieve. Uh, the uh, the OV version of this uh, as as has been mentioned before, is the uh, the automatic system here, uh, where essentially at the start of their round, uh, they have a chance to activate every activatable ability in their list, uh, which includes the Envenom ability here, which means they effectively just have uh, guaranteed uh, debuffs on their weapons all the time, because this will eventually roll. Um, most of the time, they're positioning and trying to get into better shots, so this creates this, uh, this very come-and-go feeling for the ninja here. For comparison, because I feel like this needs a, a little bit of explanation, uh, back in PSP, the ninja was actually 
designed to be this kind of tricky sort of unit, but it didn't end up playing that way. Uh, the combination of this uh, Steel Stance ability, as well as the fact that uh, Dexterity Weapons gained a whole lot of scaling, uh, created this unfortunate situation where they became the premier melee powerhouse. Um, essentially, uh, katanas uh, scaled harder than regular swords. Um, on top of this, one-handed weapons tended to scale better than regular swords, plus they were attacking twice, so that was essentially twice the uh, training speed. Um, and then at the same time, they could essentially just turn on Steel Stance and say, hey, I'm just not basically invisible to the enemy now, because my defense is now high enough that there is no priority in targeting me. Um, so they just basically ran up and carved things up, and it was kind of ridiculous. Uh, they were pretty squishy if they ever couldn't afford Steel Stance, which was pretty unlikely, because they were the Agility Specialist, which meant that they were always friggin' hitting, which meant that they were always getting all of the TP bonuses off their swords from hitting things and, you know, gaining all their stuff in the background. and. Yeah, ultimately just created this unfortunate situation where they became a kind of the premier melee powerhouse despite being the sneaky guy. Um, uh, for context, by the way, I've said before that uh, uh, that uh, uh, kind of double attack units in uh, Reborn aren't much of a thing, but I do want to point out that they do have their place. Uh, like, for example, I have a ninja right here that stuns, silences, and poisons or at least has the potential to multiple times with several different attacks with a build like this, while also retaining a lot of finisher coverage. Um, so something like this can still work, uh, they just really want to dedicate to the bit, so to speak. Um, okay, so now that we've ranted on about that, let's actually move on to the next topic of debuff weapons, because they actually took very, very different approaches here as well, even though both of them agreed that debuff weapons were a cool idea. So, for those unaware, uh, they're essentially weapons will have different effects on them in certain situations. Um, so, for example, right here, this guy's claws will, uh, will inflict poison on hit, and if we go over to the, uh, the reborn side here, we'll see that uh, the sword inflicts stun, this will inflict silence. Uh, there's a lot of different potential debuffs that different units can apply in different ways. If a 100% uh, hit or crit move is, a, is attached to that attack, they will always land that debuff. This is a technique that's very useful, uh, not only for crowd control, but for shutting down individual units and just generally controlling the fight. Now, there were debuff weapons back in the original uh, PSP version, however, they were fairly weak. Um, so this kind of created a bit of a bummer situation where you'd have this cool debuff weapon, and then you just never use them outside of the start of the game, because frankly you were just better off focusing on damage and leaving the debuff to your wizards. This became a very boring thing very quick, and also tended to scrub wizards out of existence in that version, um, uh, basically because uh, their damage was com almost completely resisted by armor unless they were uh, unless they were rocking really high stats or augments or something else. Um, but on top of that, their team buffs had a tendency to be completely ignored because many of the pieces of equipment would actually carry immunities on there. Uh, so this is something that uh, both versions addressed in their own ways, uh, where. If we take a look at uh, if we take a look at uh, equipment in One Vision, we'll see that uh, they've changed the weapon system to have a lot of categories. So almost every weapon category will inflict a debuff of some kind. Uh, I hate when the no when the uh, snow shows up and suddenly everything gets all sniffly. Anyway, so back on topic. So one of the cool things about One Vision is that basically every weapon will have a debuff to uh, uh, to do something with. Uh, they they pretty much all have secondary effects of some description because that effect is very fun to play around with. It's one of the coolest features of the PSP version. Ma basically makes that weapon feel special to a degree. So like for example this unit right here, uh, he's given a dagger with a bind effect. So what he does is he sets up a guaranteed hit move. So like the uh, uh, the fencer will have an ability uh, that uh, that will essentially uh, here. Let's go ahead and show you this. So, he's temporarily switched it out because I was trying to get a hold of some fairies, but he puts on Faded Circle, this will put a Sure Strike in an area, which will mean that his dagger, uh, for a relatively cheap cost, will be guaranteed to inflict his, uh, uh, his bind status here. So, essentially he goes forward, he binds something, and then he repeatedly uh, uh, shield bashes it with a uh, heavy scutum here to stun it in place. Uh, there's quite a lot of debuffs in these games. Now, uh, this is another kind of little branch split that happened between the two. In one, in one Vision's case, they basically added them to pretty much everything. In Reborn's case, they boiled it down to the essentials. Um, we'll get to more on that in a moment, but that's usually the point uh, where you know people start screaming about Corpo Daddy or what have you. That 
that like, oh, there's technically less stuff, that means that it's all gutted, and like, there's nothing gutted whatsoever. The amount of redundancy in these systems is insane. Uh, like I saw somebody, uh, somebody the other day uh, kind of coming to the realization of like, well, I noticed that water doesn't have poison mist anymore. Has the system been gutted? And then it's like, wait a minute. So you had water that had poison mist, you had weapons that poison, you had arrows that poison, you had uh, scrolls that poison, you had octopi that poisoned, <laughs> you had finishers that poisoned, like, uh, you had dark that poisoned, uh, you had uh, fire that poisoned, like, just freaking everything's got poison on there. <laughs> of some description, and not to mention multiple different versions of Poison. The whole idea with the PSP system was, like, extraordinary redundancy. Um, so, essentially, when uh, when you hear things about, like, the Reborn system was boiled down to the essentials, there's still a shitload of stuff there, it's just a lot less redundant. So, for example, instead of Poison Mist, you just have Poison on the Dark Tree, because... The debuffs are on dark because they don't need to have flavored element versions anymore because nobody is specifically locked into one element anymore. Um, and then if you want to have that same like massive splash uh, poison effect, suddenly the octopi with its uh, poison uh, poison cloud ability actually matters, uh, or your poisoned arrows on your ninjas matter, or stuff like that. And basically, it just gets to shine more. Um, it's actually funny, because Poison probably got the hardest buff of anything, but anyway, whatever. Uh, I'm getting off track again. So, debuff weapons and things. Let's continue on here. So, uh, so again, in, in one vision's case, they basically give you access to all of these right away, and this leads to a lot of uh, fun combinations where you can start getting your builds online if you know what you're doing. And that's kind of the, the big break point here. Reborn is good at teaching you uh, how to uh, how to learn to do things. One Vision is going to give you a hell of a lot of tools to play with if you already know what you're doing. Uh, so, for example, the Chain Whip on a Terror Knight is not necessarily going to be super crazy uh, as far as being this you know insane offensive tool. But at the same time, if there's somebody that was previously trained as a Beast Tamer, they have the Tame ability, they can potentially have a very, very high chance to uh, recruit Beasts all of a sudden, while also being very good at shutting them down. The combination of Fear and False Strike uh, will essentially turn a lot of the faster Beast units fairly docile. Um, basically, Beast uh, units got fairly similar treatment across both versions, but we'll get to that later. Anyway, so... There's a lot of weapons with a lot of different debuffs. Every class got access to new weapon categories and what have you. Some of them are cross-classable, some of them aren't. Um, but point point is, again, same old running theme. Big ol' uh, kind of a split in terms of adding different features to different weapons and then making them into categories. So, like, let's say you have your, um, uh, your standard uh, two-handed katanas here that will essentially hit on TP. Uh, this would be the equivalent of hitting uh, on MP and Reborn. Um, but then if you uh, side-grade it, uh, you get uh, something like the Spirit Blade over here, which is going to give you a one-time use uh, kind of AoE finisher, um, where it's going to hit in an area around that unit, uh, essentially trying to do the draw-out ability from FFT. Uh, whereas the one-handed versions, if you go over to the uh, the standard katanas here, they'll once again give you a luck boost, and they'll give you a, a drop in TP. This will be universal, essentially just kind of going up over time. Uh, there's no variation between these weapons, it's just it will do better over time. And then, if you wanted to side-grade this, you can make a, a very uh, very dodgy type of build here. So, like, this guy over here uses a uh, Mage Silver along with a bunch of uh, uh, evasion equipment in order to give him very high avoidance. Uh, so, essentially, he's min-maxing for his avoidance using his equipment. Uh, this is, once again, something that used to be done with passives back in the PSP version, which tended to lead to a situation where you basically were just having no clue whether or not you actually would be able to make use of your build or not, because you would just suddenly show up, and all your strength is being negated by that that guy's fortify, all of your true strike is being negated by that guy's dodge, and that got kind of annoying, because you had to just go check the spell list. Um, in, uh, in One Vision's case, they said, okay, let's just make this into easily recognizable equipment. So you take one look at a unit, and it's like, okay, Heavy armor, whip. I get the general idea of what this dude's about. Um, or, you know, I see this guy's got a spear, or I see, you know, bow, two pieces of dodgy equipment, and then one uh, uh, one glove for more offensive potential. So they've got a little bit better penetration, but they've got a lot of evasion to them. Or this guy, extremely heavy armor and shutdown weapons, he's all about being an asshole. Um, or, <laughs> we've got, uh, uh, or we've got this guy over here who's... Uh, 
just entirely built to be stupid. His whole shtick is that he's trying to set up Soul Spark in order to get a guaranteed charm off of beating something with this uh, uh, with this uh, frickin' instrument over here. So, anyway, I, hopefully you get the general idea here that the idea in One Vision is more and more and more and more and more tools, which is really fun for those that know how to use it. And in Reborn's case, it was trying to make what's already there feel special. So, uh, like right here, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the way that Reborn handled carrying its weapons forward to the future. You'll notice this save file is in the postgame. I specifically wanted to do this to point out that this guy was still good in the postgame. So, uh, like something like the Dark Plus One with a silencing effect on there, or the, uh, the Muzo Blade with a uh, stunning effect on there. Uh, essentially, this combination means that he's primarily swinging for his, uh, for his debuffs here. Uh, for context, uh, his dagger over here uh, is one of the earliest weapons that you can get a hold of, and the attack value is 54. Uh, Higher-end weapons that he probably could be going and crafting at this point are going to be closer to the like 80 to 100 mark, but essentially he's doing, roughly speaking, 50 less per attack. This th That has some asterisks to it. At max rank, it's effectively you know 50 less attack or what have you. Uh, with this one, Where's the Muzo Blade over here, uh, if we go and compare it with its contemporaries uh, for penetration and whatnot, is more or less on par with everything else here. So, he's taking a, uh, essentially a drop in damage off this dagger, he's taking a somewhat drop in damage on this Muzo Blade here, but, all intents and purposes, he's basically losing like 60 damage, but he's getting access to two different uh, debuffs on those attacks. Again, there's plenty of asterisks in terms of, oh, well, technically, you know, if you calculate this, 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 it, it you know, is a higher or lower number. Point being, this dagger will not hit a 1. Back in PSP, or occasionally back in One Vision there, if your hit is ineffective, you simply hit a 1. In this particular case, there is still an armor system, but it, it's functioning in a different way. So the original PSP system was very, very focused on giving you that sort of D&D armor threshold kind of feeling. It was a constantly moving number that was difficult to calculate, but it constantly gave you this feeling of, oh shoot, I just went up from rank 4 to rank 5, and now my shots do like twice the damage. I don't know what happened, but I must have done something right. Basically, as soon as you break that threshold, you get all of your bonuses. That can mean a lot of things in a lot of different situations. In the PSP version, it basically was a combination of your weapon, your weapon's bonuses, your personal bonuses that came from your strength and bonuses, anything left over from your stats, anything from prevailing element in the frickin' ambient air or what have you, and any buffs or uh, debuffs that were applied to that equation in question. Point being, shitload of stuff going on, but you break past threshold, big number, make you big happy, and the dopamine goes crazy. Now, uh, in One Vision's case, they, <laughs> what they did uh, was they uh, they made it so that it was more clear whether something was essentially classed as a heavy unit or classed as a light unit. You see something in heavy armor, they've got a lot of vitality, they've got a lot of health, they've got a lot of defense. That unit is going to be hard to break through, which means you want a heavy weapon to break them, or you want to disable them with a debuff. The answer to those problems is a bit more clear, and it gives you kind of more direct corridors to answering kind of your strategic situation there. It's like, there's a heavy guy over there, he's going to be slow, we'll just go ahead and hit him further with, you know, more slow, or say they're a heavy caster, we hit him with some mute or something, just disable them with some debuffs, maybe go poison them or something, put them behind some barricades, make them a problem for another day. Bog them down, is the general idea. Um, whereas uh, in in the, uh, the Reborn side of things, uh, there was a big focus on constant flow, so... Your weapons will do reduced damage, but they won't do completely ineffective damage. However, everything can do wacky damage, and that's when we get to the elements. Uh, so the elements in this one, if you are hitting effectively, and again, effective hits mean something very different in every one of these three versions. So before somebody says uh, that they're, oh, it's not the same because it's technically a different formula, I know. It's the same effective idea. Uh, anyway, so to to get all of your crazy damage multipliers or your effective hit, uh, for a more simplified term here, in uh, Reborn, essentially you want to abuse your elements or you want to abuse your debuffs. So, uh, for example, the, one of the reasons that his uh, dagger and sword combo is so strong here is because he's got multiple of these answers. If there's a dark unit, it doesn't matter what else is going on unless he is weakened. Uh, this advent sign will hit that uh, dark unit for a ton of extra damage. If he uh, uses this lightning on a water unit, it'll hit them for a ton of extra damage. Same thing for, uh, you know, using your yellows on your greens or anything like that. 
Uh, so potentially he's got several gigantic uh, uh, damage options all of a sudden over there. These will typically bypass defenses, they'll be multiplied by a bunch, and if that target is breached, that is a further 50%. All buffs, um, essentially anything that uh, that moves the sliding scale of numbers in one or in not one vision in Reborn, is way wackier. So the numbers go way nuttier in this version. Uh, you may have noticed I was talking about how strengthen got replaced with equipment stacks uh, back in um, uh, or uh, over in one vision there. In Reborn's case, you still have some equipment stacking, and it'll move you in that direction. So like casters in general probably want to stick to stick to putting a few pieces of balder on there um uh, but uh, but generally speaking you're only getting a minor bonus uh but uh you typically would still for example stick with something like a you know a, a bigger defense bonus for your armor or what have you but if the unit is already defensive enough then you could potentially say okay look i see this uh, balder helmet over here it might improve my uh, casting ability a little bit if that's what he was going for Realistically, in this case, he would just want uh, something that would improve his dexterity, which is not many things on this list, uh, so we'll just uh, go ahead and uh, switch him primarily for defense. But if we take a look over at our Valkyrie over here, we see that she's using a shield for boosting intelligence. Uh, she's got a, a dress that gives intelligence in mind, uh, the uh, Freud helm here for a bit of resistance, and just because it's super frickin' jacked in terms of stats. Uh, some intelligence off the fire gauntlets, some more uh, intelligence in mind off the boots, and then more mind off this thing. Primarily because she's looking to uh, to pick up a crit bonus uh, out on the field, maybe a magic bonus out on the field, and then just basically just turbo one-shot something with her free casts and her self eyed here. Essentially fewer steps to getting those nutty numbers. And this is kind of where there's where's that where there's that uh, big kind of understanding split between the two. Because to get your uh, to get your nutty numbers in, let's say one vision, you typically have to set up uh, set up something a bit less obvious. So as I mentioned earlier, like if you run into a heavy target and you need to bog them down, right? So like let's take a look at the uh, at the Varden over here. So he's set up in such a uh, such a way that he's meant to try and okay, that should hopefully fix it. All right, so. Over in in One Vision, their version of this whole thing, of the whole like element beating element thing, is not actually elements beating other elements, but uh, essentially bonuses, uh, kind of uh, stacking and hitting in the right location. So, for example, something like uh, like an Opus over here would be considered a lightweight. Realistically speaking, he doesn't stand that much of a chance whenever fighting a heavy unit. So he's trying to equip some pieces of uh, evasive equipment in order to survive long enough for his uh, regeneration ability over here to keep him operating. This is this is more of like your, I guess, more traditional RPG kind of mindset of like you're you're getting just enough to keep your your abilities uh, keeping you running. You're equipping a whole lot of abilities on your list. Uh, he keeps things like a corrosion, which has fairly low odds to hit in his hands, um, but. Um, that basically just there to try to throw out some poison to uh, hit in another direction if he's being harassed by, or if a lot of units are being harassed by arrows. Uh, he's got some uh, some haze to block that off. If there's casters that are being a pain, he's got solidified to boost with that. If somebody's about to get a big finisher, he'll go for a low percentage chance to go use this frostbite ability. Um, he wants to use this ripple, but he still doesn't have the level to use it, even though he got it, like, hours ago at this point. <laughs> he carries a axe to slow things down specifically for the uh, for the purpose of doing his uh, delay job, uh, that he essentially gets a, um, a mighty strike uh, buff from either of the casters on the team, or any of the three casters from the team, uh, goes and uh, hits something uh, backwards in order to slow them down, uh, uses the uh, recovery time delay on the axe to, to further slow them down, uh, activates his uh, uh, Hopanga winds for some recovery, and then attempts to hold out and you know attack somebody else in that uh, in that time. So he, there's a lot of technical application to the way that that unit is handled, right? And that over here on the uh, on the reborn side of things, it's actually somewhat similar, but in a completely different direction. See, in his in this particular case, the um, uh, the Varden becomes more of a scavenger type of unit, where due to having a higher movement. This give them, gives them access to more cards on the field, and I see people say all the time that the cards are random and it ruins the game for them, and oh my god, my immersion. Considering the game has had cards since the SNES, I still don't buy that immersion argument. I'm sorry, if you're improving the sounds, you're improving the visuals, 
like adding all kinds of different visual elements to the background, improving the visual elements that were already there on little things like candle flickers, and we're going to complain that the cards are suddenly blue sometimes now as the big immersion breaker. <laughs> I just don't buy it. Anyway, so anyways, as far as that concerned, that's concerned, we take a step back and look at it from a different direction. So in, in the case of One Vision Canopus here, we look at him at a case, as a case of he's got a, a lot of uh, pre-built backup plans specifically for his role of being a distraction, right? So if we take a look over at the Reborn version of Canopus over here, uh, he is similarly looking to set up multiple backup plans, but essentially he's setting up for a lot of different scenarios rather than trying to achieve a particular job. So hybrids really had their heyday in Reborn here. Uh, where we have a case where he didn't require that much additional training for much of anything. His spells and his weapon will use the same ranking skill. Typically, within a couple fights, he'll already have this to the maximum of wherever it's allowed to be at any given time. But we have multiple different, uh, different little bits and pieces on this class. We have the essentials, but that doesn't mean that they don't do what they need to do. So, his crossbow ability gives him access to an AoE, uh, gives him access to a multi-hit move, uh, gives him access to a debuff move, as well as gives him access to a very quick finisher that he can deploy with his current element. So he is water. Now in this particular case, what he's looking at is a case where he has a crossbow, um, and this is again a, a build that I brought up multiple times because I feel it really encapsulates a lot of the stuff that you can do in this version. But this crossbow has a spell slot effect on it. There's a lot of items that have spell slot effects on them, but in older versions, they barely got a chance to shine. Uh, so, like, back in PSP, you had to build entirely around using those spell slots to get anything out of it whatsoever. Uh, they were used quite a bit in the uh, multiplayer uh, type of stuff, if anyone here watched those videos. Um, so, like, for example, a warrior with a Runax uh, water, uh, you know, Aqua Blast setup, it actually was a pretty good, uh, good setup. Nobody in their right mind would possibly ever grind the situation out in a normal gameplay scenario, but for multiplayer, if you're using cheats to set it all up, it worked really well. In this case, you're basically playing by that rule set, that you're already maxed out, you don't have to worry about your augments, you already are your element. If you're using your weapon, both your weapon and your element effectively, you are, in effect, using a maxed out augment rank. If you're not utilizing it at all, then it doesn't play a part but it also gives you a weakness as a downside, giving you more kind of play as far as the elements there go. Anyway, in his case, uh, since spells will gain more benefits uh, than physical attacks for matching their element, he has access to uh, three replenishable spells in the form of his Aqua Blast here, and he's got a uh, three casts of an AoE spell over here. Now, uh, over here, Alcolas is giving him his instill effect, which will give him his, uh, like, plus 15 or 20 whatever percent, um, uh, on his physical attacks, and on top of that, he's got Dragon Slayer, because he can equip the Dragon Slayer set over here. Now, the reason that this all comes together is because his class is based around movement, and he's innately able to fly, creating this fun situation where he is uniquely able, well, not technically unique, but uniquely enough, uh, able to scavenge a lot of the cards that nobody else is bothering to get to. So, like, say a card randomly spawned, not even spawned, let's say somebody just shot out a bunch of lightning spells all over an area and it blew up several card or several grass tiles, and it caused, let's say, a couple magic cards and a crit card to spawn right? So, if he's going and attacking normally, like if he's in his normal unbuffed state, he's going in and he's looking for squishies to go target with his crossbow. But depending on the cards he gets, every part of this build can be very different. Say he finds some physical cards, some crit cards, or what have you, Death Whale will now be instantly capable of one-shotting things. Uh, say he finds only uh, Fizz Up cards and maybe some MP cards, it might be worth spamming Brimstone Hail. Um, or if he finds uh, magic cards and crit cards or what have you, then suddenly he's a very effective and fast caster. Or if there's a, if there's a dragon on there, he, you know, he's basically a dragoon now. Essentially, he is built on multiple jobs at once. He is not looking to fit a particular role, he is looking to adapt. And that's kind of why there's that kind of difficulty in translating builds from one game to another, where it's the same idea of this guy can do multiple different things, but he's not looking to achieve the same job. He's looking to change jobs, but has the tools to adapt between those jobs accordingly. Uh, similarly, uh, if we go and compare something like the uh, the Warlock uh, over in uh, in One Vision, and compare the uh, uh, the Valkyrie over in uh, uh, in uh, Reborn, there, 
we'll get a similar, uh, similar type situation where both are essentially a jack of all trades uh, type of unit, um, entirely built around adapting to their situation, right? So in the case of the uh, One Vision Warlock, uh, they're one of a handful of item specialists, which means that this guy can throw items from his inventory, so he's going to get access to more item abilities. Uh, for further context, because the context never ends and this is just a comparison hell that has no escape, <laughs> uh, Field Alchemy was required in the PSP version to use items beyond the very basic stuff. Um, however, there were too many ranks of it to reasonably keep track of what did what, so in by the end, you just gave everyone Field Alchemy 4 and forgot about it. So you just lost one of your slots forever. Um, in the case of One Vision, they changed it so that uh, the items in general are better across the board, and there's two ranks of Field Alchemy, um, and only a few select uh, classes are able to access them. Uh, the way the Reborn approached it uh, was that anybody can use any item, but they're limited to a stock of four that they carry on them XCOM style. Uh, essentially, they have the, uh, <laughs> the XCOM utility belt, as it were. Anyway, in the case of the One Vision Warlock, this is a guy that's uh, built around many different ideas. They are a combination of the Knight of Lotus Warlock, the original Draconic Warlock, um, the Warlock from back in the um, uh, back in the uh, SNES game, as well as some stuff from, from uh, Ogre Battle 64, as well as just kind of various tropes and whatnot uh, from, uh, uh, from various tabletop things. Like, for example, the Warlock happens to look a bit like a bard, which is why he's able to use instruments in this particular case, which we're all given the chance of charming some because I guess, you know, Red Violin or what have you. By the way, I don't know why anybody would show Little Kid Me that movie. Uh, there was a surprising amount of banging to violin music. Anyway, so, in his particular case, he's able to do a lot of things at once. He's still able to do the golem controlling th thing from before. He's able to specialize in racial skills to improve his ability to control those golems. Uh, can uh, can access a lot of different uh, spell, uh, uh, spell types. In this case, I just got the Warlock on this playthrough, so the the access is going to be somewhat limited but in his case uh, the warlock gets access to overhead type spells um, as well as uh, uh, debuffs of multiple different varieties again his particular setup was attempting to use soul spark which is basically using the warrior's mighty strike ability as a spell uh, to add to his weapon to guarantee his charm effect yeah it's a lot of steps to get to the same thing don't question me i just felt like going for it um at the same time he's uh he's looking to uh to be a bit of a you know buffer a debuffer guy here as well um so he's specializing in three different uh, sets of magic which are going to be taking three of his slots um at the same time he's primarily using light as his offensive uh, uh element up to this point i just wanted to make a laser warlock for some reason please bear in mind i'm not trying to like <sighs> Oof, that's unfortunate that is a laptop falling off a shelf. Anyway, thankfully it landed on something soft. So what I'm trying to do in all of these different cases is I'm always trying out different builds for whatever happens to shake out. Uh, there's... Like, I realize that the Warlock build in this case is far from optimal because I just want to have him do a, a ton of shit at once. <laughs> it's just how it goes sometimes, you know? Um, so, when it comes to training times, yeah, he is definitely behind. Uh, the more standard on training times up to this point would be the Archer that's currently almost at rank 4. Um, uh, have they ever made use of their Orology yet? No. Anyway. Uh, so, point being, they throw items uh, as far as the skills that they can learn. Uh, they're able to distill items. They're able to do those resonance abilities uh, from the Shaman here. Uh, when I say distill items... I mean that they are just able to fart out a consumable and use it on the spot in the form of Distill Life, Distill Mind, and then there will be a, a Distill, whatever the other one is, Distill Power, I think, uh, for, uh, for a TP boost uh, down the line. They get their parries, they get their counter hits, uh, they get all of this uh, all new weapon access uh, from, uh, from whips to cudgels to katanas to daggers, basically doing a lot of the stuff that they've been kind of a... Uh, it, more traditionally associated with over the course of the series. They still get their draconic stuff and whatnot, but point point being, they're built around entirely around this idea of they're doing way too much because they're, I guess, a scholarly learning addict, as you do. They are the college student of One Vision. <laughs> like, I need to do 80 hobbies at once and also learn everything forever. What do you mean, what is sleep? Um, okay. Then let's go ahead and take a look at the Valkyrie uh, over uh, in Reborn here, which was, again, designed in a kind of similar sense. 
Like any uh, any other unit, they you know get access to all their items. Uh, they get access to their finishers. They've got access to different uh, types of finishers, as you do, as you'd kind of expect. Again, same thing for coverage. However, in their particular case, I've personally always found myself sticking with swords. Um, because now we have a unit that's, let's say, um, they have a combination of... Let's go ahead and put med uh, Meditate on there, because we'll pretend we're not in Palace of the Dead for the moment. Where we've got a unit, let's say, that's got their swords, they've got their Meditate. Their Meditate 2 means that they have a finisher capable of doing both uh, air damage as well as a really high chance to poison whenever they want to. Uh, or they can hit in an AoE whenever they want to. Uh, then at the same time, they have Conserve MP over here to constantly uh, spam out uh, summons for a lot of, uh, a lot of quick damage there. Um, this is this is one of those uh, one of those situations um, where, as far as summons are concerned, I'm still like I'm still on the boat of Valkyries just being the downright best summoners. It's just being able to consistently cast for free and still have the option to piss, uh, to uh, uh, switch over into finishers is ridiculous. <laughs> it's just plain old overpowered. Um, anyway. So point being, uh, they're getting all of their kind of intelligence bonuses off their pieces of equipment over here to slightly boost this, um, which actually gets us over to the magic differences between the different uh, ones as well. So, like in Reborn's case, there was a bigger focus on kind of stats and what have you, but all of the weapon category or all of the damage categories did it differently. So, like in in the case of melee, they would be stable damage against everything. They've got a great amount of access in terms of, uh, of finishers being able to punish any element that they want, but they have to be close up uh, in order to do anything. In terms of magic, it's very stable. It's barely resisted by the things that uh, that it hits, and in tip in a general sense, it has a pretty solid amount of range, but they very rarely get defensive options, and they cost MP to use, which the Valkyrie basically entirely overcomes that weakness. In the case of ranged attacks, they can essentially go from one to a million ridiculously fast, but uh, they have a hard time actually penetrating defenses, so they've got long range, they've got potentially incredible power, but then, you know, if they end up bouncing off of armor, they do nothing. Um, and being able to uh, to effectively uh, break those defenses is what makes uh, archers so so potentially threatening. Um, but this kind of interesting uh, interesting little situation there uh, between these different uh, different classes here, where in this case they can be the item specialist, they can be the finisher specialist, they can be you know the, the team caster, they can be the uh, the tank over here if you uh, set their equipment up a little differently. They can still be all of these things at once. Um, but it's a lot easier for a new player to come in and understand, like, hey, free MP, free damage boost, spell do big number because it attacked many times. <laughs> so that's a lot easier to understand. Which, again, is not to put down the sheer amount of crazy bullshit that you can do over in one vision, I'm just saying this is how they handle it differently. You've got one elegant solution over here, and then one technically also... Okay, it's like the difference between, like, the elegant solution and the well-engineered solution. <laughs> because those can be entirely different. Of Like, here's, like, here's basically... Uh, what would be a good car example for this? Ah... <sighs> I don't know. Uh, I think I'll have to think on that one. Because I was about to say, the, like, the Mercedes thing, but that that basically would apply to both in different ways. Like, in terms of being overly... Actually, no, it's like the... Uh, would that make sense? No. I was about to say Mercedes and BMW, but no. It's like, in both cases, technically speaking, certain aspects could be seen as really efficient or over-engineered or what have you. I don't know. Forget that. Let's just move on here. Uh, what's, what else is on this list? I... I kid you not, I've gone on so many tangents, I'm like 10% down this list. <laughs> Let's see, both made food expensive. Uh, food is like 20, 30k in both versions. Um, oh, revives. Okay, so revive differences between the two are... This is actually one of the few cases where they took a look at something and decided to go about it in a totally different way. So, one of the major departures of the PSP version as opposed to the SNES version uh, was that uh, when it came to revives, uh, they became something that you would just uh, just kind of have constant access to. So back in the original SNES version, if a unit died, they were just dead. Like that, that was just that, just it. They were donezo. They were, they weren't coming back um, unless you happen to have revivify on a cleric uh, or uh, or they happen to be carrying a blessing stone. Now, for whatever bizarre reason. 
Uh, when it came to the uh, the Blessing Stones, um, you very rarely got a hold of those. There's like one or two, I think, uh, over the course of the entire story. And then uh, after after a little while, I believe you could get them in Deneb's shop or something. Or maybe they were a rare drop in Palace of the Dead. I forget. Okay, so... So yeah, as far as those revives went, your revives were technically practically non-existent in the early game. You got one auto-revive item, basically. Um, and then you didn't get Revivify until Chapter 4, uh, which at that point just pretty much eliminated the death mechanic. Because um, unless it was your actual Revivify user that died, you basically were just sitting there trying to make the fight not end uh, while you were waiting to, uh, to get everybody back up on their feet. Um, there was basically no penalty outside of accidentally uh, uh, going and losing, like, let's say, Olivia to uh, uh, transforming into an Angel Knight. Um, yeah, that's that's a weird thing that can happen. Uh, Angel Knights used to be an automatic transformation. Like, if somebody had the right alignment and the right uh, uh, kind of stats and what have you, they just sort of became an Angel now. Anyway, uh, so point being, as far as the revives went, they were super limited in that version. Uh, when it came to, um, uh, to PSP, though, they decided to FFTify it, uh, where they became something that you could get a hold of basically for free. Uh, if, if you didn't know, um, like many would potentially go to the shop to buy items, you could just go to Tynemouth Hill uh, in the original, um, it, that is to say the original PSP version, and you could just get infinite, um, uh, infinite Blessing Stones. Uh, if you had a rogue on your team, you could steal more from each of the clerics. Each of them had one in their steal pile, and then they also had a chance to drop one to three of them when killed. Uh, so you effectively got them for free on your first uh, grind map uh, in the entire game. So that was um, a decision. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure why they decided to make them so free, but whatever. Anyway. So uh, so both, both of these versions uh, looked at all of that. Um, this is actually not to even mention the fact that uh, units also got a bleed-out timer instead of just dying immediately, and also got multiple lives, because of course they did. Um, so, in most situations, I think uh, I think the average that I've seen for folks uh, losing anyone in PSP is pretty similar to like the way that I did, uh, which was typically losing one or two people over the course of a playthrough, which doesn't really sell the whole, hey guys, this is a desperate war scenario where anybody can die thing very well. So, both versions took a look at this and said, okay, this is kind of kind of fucky, how do we fix it? Um, so, in one vision's case, they decided to arguably take the uh, hardcore RPG approach, which is why, like, I would say this decision alone is probably one of the main reasons that people consider one vision like a hard mode. It's, I would say between the two, the difficulty can swing either way depending on the map. Um, but uh, I wouldn't say that one is necessarily harder than the other. But the way that the system works in One Vision is that something has to be sacrificed in order for something else to come back to life. So if you, uh, for example, lose a unit, uh, they get downed, um, you'll wind up in a situation where you have to, uh, uh, to sacrifice uh, another unit in order to get them back up on their feet. They don't lose anything, they're just basically warped out of the fight. So it's actually a fun way to, uh, to make losses, uh, losses permanent, you know? Uh, feels uh, feels pretty good in that regard. Now, <clears throat> uh, the way that uh, the uh, reborn handled it, however, was taking a more actiony approach, uh, in which uh, you had you still had very limited revive items. In fact, you were a lot more limited in terms of your revives. Uh, you couldn't use scrolls, uh, so scrolls were a feature that both took out. Uh, before you could basically just go and turn on your magic stuff at any point. Uh, anybody could use any magic whatsoever. It just was a one-time use thing instead of uh, instead of something that they uh, that they learned permanently, you know. So, so for example, if you wanted poisonous arrows on anyone in the PSP version, you would just buy a bunch of poison scrolls, and there you go. Suddenly, you know, you've got a, a friggin' poisonous staff on your wizard or what have you. Uh, from an RPG sense, it's clear what they were going for, you know, more of a Skyrim kind of a situation, <laughs> but um, but still, you know, it got a little silly in terms of what you could do with it, especially if you bought uh, 99 Paradigm Shifts and just gave yourself infinite time forever. So, Reborn's focus was on taking those original functions and making them work as they were originally intended. The, essentially, they were limiting options in order to make sure that you used them right, so to speak. And One Vision's approach was to rework them so that they just work differently. So, uh, so again, 
sacrificing a unit to get somebody back up, unless you're using an Angel Knight. Uh, Angel Knights uh, have the unique distinction of being able to bring somebody up with an actual, um, uh, with an actual positive, uh, I guess, net gain, where they can essentially bring up multiple units at once with uh, their sacrifice ability, I believe is how that works. It's been a bit of a hot, hot minute, but I believe that's how that works. Um, but it gives a unique flavor to the Angel Knight in this particular version. Now, Reborn's uh, approach to it was that uh, you can carry up to four revive items on every one of your people. Realistically, I would recommend just kind of keeping one on every other unit. It's just kind of a generally uh, good way to do it. Uh, anyway, uh, and also you have theoretically infinite revives on your casters. Now, two interesting things that they changed about it uh, were that A, you didn't have to wait for your turn to show up anymore, so if a unit was revived, they would just instantly act. Uh, it, was a, it was a very interesting change that they did there uh, because it created, uh, uh, created a very quick uh, comeback uh, kind of moment where if you had revive items on multiple units uh, in your team, you could theoretically just revive your entire team and have an, have an infinite turn right then and there. It, it sounds gamey, but it feels so damn good when you're about to lose and you're thinking like, man, I'm gonna have to redo this entire fight. And then suddenly you're like, oh, I see a little blue dot in that inventory and then everybody's back and you make a big swing in the other direction. Like it's basically your one last gasp, you know, your one last uh, stand for your party and it feels so good when it works. <laughs> so either way, I, like from a gameplay perspective, I freaking love that. It feels so damn good. Um, Again, is it somewhat uh, somewhat gamey? Yes, but technically every approach to this is somewhat gamey if you think about it from a certain perspective. It's like this is just kind of the running theme here. No matter what version you do, the original uh, you know instant death version, it became gamey as soon as revive was available whatsoever. But if you don't allow a revive, people get pissed off and end up getting demotivated because they you know don't don't have any way to bring people back once the game gets hard enough. Um, you end up just running into the same kind of easy mode mechanics throughout all of it. PSP tried to make it harder and then tried to give you way more revives, but then also kind of overdid it by giving you way too many ways to potentially just infinitely stall out fights as you will. So that wasn't exactly an ideal scenario either. Actually, one little note on this. This doesn't count as a chariot usage. We'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> I just wanted to mention it because I forgot to turn on and still... Anyway, um, so the ability to, uh, to have fewer revives but then come back in a big way feels really good, but it also creates a fun build option for your casters, where if you can get somebody to, uh, to be above 100 MP, then they can come back and bring in another unit as well. Uh, so essentially they're, they're kind of building for a backup plan, and that also just feels very good to pull off. Yes, it's gamey, again, every version will be gamey in its own way. Um, Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, so we have the instant revive thing going on, but also we have a situation where MP became far more limited. So in One Vision's approach, uh, they made it limited by the factor of you still technically have to sacrifice a unit, so there's no real way to game the system there. Um, in the case of, uh, of Reborn there, they left a way to game the system, but they made it more fun to do. So instead of, for example, using resurrection scrolls or just using infinite items or what have you, um, the way that they approached it was that uh, you'll get that unit back, and if you want to use a caster to do this, they need 100 MP. That's quite a bit, but the MP is fairly limited. So we get to MP boosting items. So what about, uh, you know, what about uh, all of your MP leaves and stuff? Well, now you can't, uh, you can't buy them, but at the same time, uh, MP is also the resource for finishers, so they became a lot more valuable. So is this just a check on finishers, or what the hell's the deal there? It's a check on everything, but also it's a way to incorporate, like, the whole system all at once. And, and that's one of the reasons that I love the way that Reborn did stuff. Because everything just seems to incorporate everything. So, with MP items getting, uh, getting kind of uh, uh, taken out of shops and whatnot, it created a situation where you're scavenging them off the ground. Now, by itself, you know, this isn't something most people are going to instinctively go and, you know, go and scavenge. Like, they're not going to know where all of these drop tiles are. But most of them are in situa are in places on maps where you'll just end up traveling through, which means that you'll accidentally end up getting a trickle of these items, giving you that idea that you're like these are here as a you know a, as a potential idea for one build, maybe two of them, um, but they're not going to be something that you want to use all of the time. So look for other ways to build your MP, and then you have the other system where you're building MP because 
well, hang on. I just tied myself into a knot there. <laughs> you build up TP in the original version by attacking stuff and getting attacked. It's essentially your overdrive bar. Um, but in the uh, in, in the PSP version, uh, it was uh, it was done in such a way uh, that uh, well. MP and TP were separate, so there were a lot of interactions that just simply didn't make sense to do. Um, more on that uh, when we get to just ways that certain skills were reshuffled later, but... <laughs> Alright, sorry, needed to go grab a drink real quick. So, okay, uh, back to it then. So, MP items limited uh, also creates a fun little uh, kind of lore thing where uh, people are going and uh, collecting these, just kind of like picking herbs uh, along the uh, the road in order to try and focus better, which is exactly what people way back in the day used to do with a lot of things that are turned into drugs now. Um, but it also created a higher value for the, uh, the MP staves later on down the road but hopefully also taught you that uh, going and attacking things with your weapon, just like you used to work for uh, TP, would cause you to uh, to go and build up additional MP as well. Creating further ideas of something like, let's say, the uh, uh, the way that Swordmasters worked in this one, where you would make builds that entirely f kind of uh, equip their skills based on how much MP they can, f uh, they can actually reasonably regenerate over the course of a turn. So, like, all of the dance abilities on a Swordmaster are slightly too much for them to be able to regenerate uh, naturally. But if they're using both of their abilities to attack multiple times per round, they're able to fund these just fine, which means that their focus then becomes uh, using their main turn to, let's say, turn on a, uh, a Spell Strike activation, and then going in for a Charm on their active turn, and then using their off turn to repeatedly uh, hit with these abilities over here. At the same time, they, uh, they can also use it for funding their finishers here, which I also should point out. One of the things that's kind of impossible to back-translate is the ability to, uh, uh, to turn off or reshuffle your finishers in some way. So if you're putting somebody on AI, um, you basically can just tell them, look, just use this move. This is all I want you to be using, you know? Um, anyway, anyway. Point being, MP system, entirely different in both cases. Uh, so, like, let's say you've got your uh, uh, your uh, revive unit over here, because that's what we, were, what we were originally talking about. Then you have a reason for something like an insight to go boost their MP bar, to go get their minimum, which would be 25% if they are revived, above 100, meaning that you can create this, like, party-wide revive chain. Uh, there's this, uh, this big focus on weird interactions between your people in a wider team sense, that it isn't just like, this skill interacts with this other skill, it's like, I can build this entire other guy for some weird, oddly specific interaction, you know? So that, that's just like, that's just fun to play around with. It's fewer pieces, requires less kind of overall knowledge of what's going on there, um, but it uh, gives you a little bit more, I guess, uh, play in terms of quickly coming up with new builds, and that's, that's another one of those things. Um, I, again, as much as I... I love the OV system and everything else. Um, the time that it takes to adjust one build into another one is night and day. Like, for RB, all you gotta do is like, wow, I just... Here's this other build. Okay. They are now built for this other build. <laughs> like, I want to switch this guy over to, let's say, you know, suddenly bow and sword, apparently. Uh, so, you know, I'll keep the counterattack on the sword. Maybe I'll uh, give him a bow with a stun effect on there or something, because I don't have any of those other ones on hand at the moment. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and give him a uh, stunning bow over here. And there we go. He's already got his, uh, his stuff already set up. We didn't have to give him any additional ranks. If he needed to rank this up, this would be like one training fight or a couple random fights uh, to go get up to, uh, 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 up to max there. Um, you know, maybe we'll go ahead and give him, let's say, probably something like a lobber, maybe throw some bombs on there, and there we go, he's already a completely different build, you know? So, the idea is that the, like, the time to build between the two is, when I'm talking about uh, speed between these different games, it's not that OV plays slow, it's just like, if you have a stupid build, because you're a crazy spazzy bastard that loves to rant about this stuff, and... <laughs> And you go into one of these, like, hmm, I just want to try this weird, dumb idea. It takes, like, five minutes in Reborn, and then it takes hours in One Vision. Like, that's... When I talk about a speed difference between the two, that's primarily what I mean there. 
Okay, but then let's go ahead and talk about something else. In terms of shields, uh, yeah, that's a total blowout. <laughs> One vision's got freaking shields for days. Uh, you want uh, dodgy shields, you want uh, heavy shields, uh, you want, uh, you know, uh, freaking uh, uh, bashing shields, you want silencing shields, you want poisoning shields, like, you just got... Any kind of shield you want, uh, whether you want reflective shields, uh, whether you want uh, uh, you, you want to have uh, offensive shields, knockback shields, uh, you've, just any shield you want, uh, One Vision's got a shield for you. It has never been shieldier than <laughs> OV. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a quick peek right here if this save doesn't crash, because some of my older saves do. Alright, so let's go ahead and... yeah, this, this is one old as hell save. Um, it's like Gorgon Shield will uh, petrify on hit. It's got the evil eye effect on there. You know, Aegis uh, will give you a regeneration effect uh, on uh, on somebody. Uh, gives you immunity to uh, to stop shackle and bind. Uh, has a knockback effect on there. Ogre Shield will inflict a stun. Uh, gives you uh, steadfast, so you can't be knocked back. Uh, will give you a guard against uh, spells if you activate it. Uh, you get a uh, Holy Shield, which will give you a Sanctify effect on Shield of the Sages. Uh, you get a Curse Ward from it. Uh, you get Rams over here that are going to stun. You get a regular Heavy Shield that are going to knock back and give you a ton of extra defense and health. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Ward Shields, which fairies love to use, uh, which will give you additional resistance and also inflict silence on somebody if you slap them with it. Um, you've got uh, Lightweight Shields uh, for giving you a lot of extra avoidance. You've got Mana Totems uh, for inflicting weak on something and also making your intelligence higher. Uh, you've got the uh, the flame and void here for giving you more damage, but also inflicting weaken on a uh, target if hit by it. These are fairly similar. Uh, you get a, a, a passive uh, trajectory on the flame and void, uh, which will uh, uh, just let you see where you're going to fire your spells if you use your uh, throwing rock ability there. Uh, I've got the, uh, here, what else we got here? Uh, we got uh, Shackling on the main Gauche, which will also give you the highest avoidance in the game. You've got the Power Fist for uh, uh, strengthening yourself and punching harder. Um, you got the uh, the Mirror Shield for reflecting damage. <laughs> you get the idea. They've got frickin' shields for days. It's, it's kind of nutty. What actually happened to the Poison Shield? I remember there being a Poison Shield. Am I crazy? I might be crazy. I, I think, uh, I think at one point, uh, the... What was it? Um, I want to say the... Where are you? Where's the spike shield? I want to say the spike shield poisoned at some point, and then it lost you a knockback category for part of the game, so they took it out. I don't remember. But it's probably something like that. And you even have fist shields. So you got, like, the uh, the second, which will be a fist weapon that is also a shield at the same time. And then at the same time, you also have thrown weapons, like the... Uh, uh, where was it? Over here? Where are you, shield? You're somewhere. There's a throwing shield! Uh, there we go. Uh, Camaria's Fist here. Uh, which will also stun on hit, and also be a throwing shield. <laughs> like, it, it gets insane with the number of shields that you've got here. So, in this category, like, it's not even close. In terms of the fancy tools and whatnot that One Vision adds, like, whether you want to have uh, grappling gauntlets, uh, whether you want uh, more shoes or whatnot, um, you've got a whole lot of uh, whole lot of different tools for whatever situation you'd like. Um, especially around the mid-game is when a lot of this stuff ends up opening up, so you start off with a lot, but you get even more. Utter overwhelmingness is probably the main issue <laughs> that Ovi has. Um, like, most of, to be honest, most of the quality of life stuff he's uh, tried to adjust over the years. So... Just to get into the quality of life stuff real quick, um, like, let's say stuff like drops, like, the drops that you want will be guaranteed in One Vision as long as they drop a bag, which is as likely as the system allows at this point. Um, in the case of, um, uh, in the case of, uh, let's say, just, well, any rare drop, they're pretty much guaranteed to show up, and they're, uh, they're going to be using it. If you're wondering, by the way, why this one's glitched out and she's got a fist in her accessory slot. You know what? People just do funny things in their off time. It's not my place to judge. Anyway. So, uh, let's go ahead and go over here. And, uh, go back to a save file that hasn't glitched out because it's been updated 80,000 times. Alright. <clears throat> so, what the hell was I getting out here? Uh, so yeah. As far as the drops go, they're as guaranteed as they can be here. However, Reborn's approach was very different in terms of the drops. So, in in Reborn's case, what they did uh, was that they still left uh, random chance drops, however, they made them way, 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 way more likely to show up. Um, 
So effectively, we're talking in some cases like 20 times the amount of items in any given area, and you're going to get something. So one of the things that they tried to do ever since SNES was a sort of trickle of random items that you would get. That there'd be certain things that were just a guaranteed find, however, uh, many of the items that you would get are essentially going to be entirely random. Um, now, the thing is, in the SNES version, this basically was limited to the Palace of the Dead entirely, and it kind of sucked. Like, you pretty much got every item on your way down, or at least like 80% of them, but most of them didn't do very much, uh, and or were programmed weird, and, and or, well, just plain didn't do anything. There were a lot of little asterisks to that particular system. They had the idea, they never finished it exactly. They didn't have the time, or budget, or anything else. Um, so then we get to, uh, to the way the PSP handled it, and unfortunately, they made the items way, way, way better, and then got ridiculously conservative with when you get to get a hold of them, uh, with a lot of items being very difficult to find, uh, and or having something like... It, it didn't actually use a direct drop rate, it was more like a variable drop rate based on your level, based on what was available in their drop pool at any given time, and a bunch of other crap. Um, but uh, anyways, really low chances to potentially drop those items, and potentially, depending on level ranges, you might just never get certain items at all. Uh, like the uh, the Crescent Bow, uh, if you got past 25 with every single class, you could no longer obtain that weapon outside of maybe a couple maps in the game if you knew where they were, um, and if archers spawned there. So it created this weird complication where just certain items were really unlikely to ever be found. Um, and this was a problem because a lot of the uh, cool endgame builds relied on a lot of these uh, a lot of these items, and a lot of classes came into their own on account of these items. And if you never got a hold of them or didn't know that they were there or anything to be found whatsoever, it just seemed like the game ended without exploring most of its mechanics, and that just feels super strange. Uh, like if you just played through and you never went into any of the side areas, you probably almost never saw a weapon with any secondary effect on it whatsoever. Um, so either way, those items were very, very, very rare. Now, uh, in One Vision's case, they added a lot of uh, guaranteed ones and added them a lot earlier. So we already saw earlier where debuff weapons became the norm for all weapon categories. Uh, now, this is a great thing from the player side, also potentially a terrifying thing from the AI side if they get a bunch of debuffs on you at once. If you know how to deal with those debuffs, the system feels fantastic to play. If you're a new player, it may quickly become overwhelming. Um, the way that uh, Reborn handled uh, this item access was that they gave you a lot of extra items that the AI does not get, a, get to get a hold of. So, for example, the crafted equipment, uh, like those debuff weapons and whatnot, you get, they don't. Uh, the AI gets stat bonuses, you get uh, cool nifty effects on your weapons and armor and stuff. So, uh, this kind of difference... Uh, probably take another step to explain. A lot of One Vision was trying to put both the player and the AI on the same playing field. Uh, in Reborn's case, it's trying to tell you a story, and it's trying to give you a specific experience. So both are intentional in their own things, both succeed in, their both, dire in both directions, you know? Anyway, so... As far as item access goes, in, like, let's say in One Vision, you'll suddenly get access to water walking boots at the very start of Chapter 2. And this is a water walk plus resilience buff, on top of having some pretty uh, decent stats on those shoes. And that's a pretty neat find, and is something very reminiscent of something like Knight of Lotus, uh, where about the same amount of uh, time in, you start getting some unique pieces of equipment, and you might potentially uh, use them throughout the entire game. That feels very good. Uh, Reborn did this to a lesser extent, as in it started around Chapter 3 instead of Chapter 2, uh, where there was a chance in pretty much every castle that fight that you ran into to get specific movement items. So sometimes you would get uh, water walking shoes, sometimes flying shoes, sometimes warping shoes. Uh, there were a lot of little items that were technically previous endgame items that you got a little bit earlier if you were clearing out maps in castles. Otherwise, you would just completely miss them if you were only going for the objective. There are a lot of these little optional drops. I should point out, technically, they're not really a new thing. They're something that PSP did, but only if you were in New Game Plus for some reason. So, like, technically speaking, you could get flight shoes uh, from one of the Cyclopes in Chapter 3, and no one ever got it, because why the hell are you in New Game Plus mode in your first playthrough <laughs> in frickin' Chapter 3? Um, so, realistically, nobody ran into that stuff, because there were a lot of strange limitations in that version. 
So, when you get to the late game areas, though, uh, Reborn goes completely wild in terms of upping the drop rates of everything. You have crafting books that are going to show up by the dozen uh, in, Pal in early Palace of the Dead. You have uh, relic items. Uh, so now, instead of unique items, uh, there's very few things that are actually unique. Um, but many of them are going to show up with uh, essentially the same uh, base stats, like the same attack values, stat values, or what have you, but their bonuses will be variable. Um, and you can combine them to keep upgrading to create a maxed out version. Uh, but essentially these weapons are stronger than they were before, they're no longer unique, and potentially can be uh, combined into something much, much stronger uh, uh, as you go on as well. Um, Additionally, uh, due to the way that these interact with the elemental system, you don't necessarily need one specific weapon to make one specific build work. Uh, like, if you have an ice guy, sure, that ice sword might give them their 10% extra damage, but at the same time, switching to a different element with a massive bonus on there might give them a lot more value. Um, so, that's, again, just kind of something to consider there. So, <laughs> I, I should mention it gives them a lot of other value because the weapon itself counts as a separate element uh, when it's going and hitting stuff. So, the weapon of the person, the weapon of the element, they are separated, they interact with each other in funky ways. It's an interesting little thing, like, in terms of overall world building. Um, in OV's case, uh, they stuck with the stacking system, but uh, at the same time, they added a lot more ways to kind of take advantage of those different elements uh, over time. Uh, they have a far wider uh, kind of layout of reasons to use every single element. Uh, in PSP, there were a lot of mistakes made in the original version over certain elements just being blatantly better than others. Um, so you basically always have a reason to use di uh, various different elements. Uh, if you hit with an element, it will make that unit weak to some other element. There's a lot more options. So, like, if you went and specifically trained up, like, just, you know, a particular element and a particular weapon, realistically, you're going to have a weapon and elements to match that, because this version, again, is all about uh, stacking those augments, so you want that. Uh, in Reborn, it's about uh, going and building adaptable uh, units that can hit with different elements, so you have those options there uh, available to you as well. Both of them expanded their options in different ways. Um, in Reborn's case, it made those endgame areas a lot faster to go through, uh, to the point that uh, uh, that uh, they actually turned off uh, finishers for a lot of the random enemies so that they're not sniping you through walls, so that you can basically feel like you're carving through this area. Uh, their stats are higher, but their uh, basically their strategic options are lower, yours are uh, yours are heightened, but your stats are lower. Like it's a fun little kind of uh, uh, juxtaposition between the two, uh, in terms of just feeling like this is a fun thing to fight, you know. Anyway, uh, in uh, One Vision's case, the fights are definitely harder. <laughs> like they've got way more uh, options in terms of punishing you, but it also means you're going to be spending way more time down there. Um, so. Just something to bear in mind. Yes, this is coming from a guy that did a frickin' solo of Palace of the Dead for One Vision. God, that took months. <laughs> anyway, um, alright. Uh, there's so much more on this particular list. Uh, <laughs> and I am completely out of time now. Alright, anyway. Uh, let's see, other quickfire stuff between the two. Uh, recruitment. Uh, recruitment is something that both versions made a a lot more kind of combat viable, uh, where the PSP version, uh, original version, uh, had it uh, to where it was too expensive to use every round. Uh, one vision, you're basically able to stack both a uh, racial effect as well as a uh, recruit rank in order to practically guarantee those recruitments. So, like, these two right here will stack on top of each other and rank up over time. Um, this, in my mind, is possibly one of the more overpowered uh, combinations uh, that's actually still left in OV. Um, as far as I understand, there, there was a thought to potentially take this out, but either way, 80% recruitment odds at a 10 TP cost. It's quite something. Anyway, it does kind of essentially mean that you can walk in, do the whole roleplay thing of like, well, technically this guy is a complete god at reprogramming golems, I guess, and then they just walk in and every golem is theirs. Um, in Reborn's case, they changed it a little bit so that uh, you can still use the recruit skills at a far lower cost and far lower hit rate, but um, essentially they have to be on that specialized unit. Uh, so for example, uh, using beast tamers to go counter beasts and dragons, uh, using uh, knights to go recruit soldiers, that kind of thing, it, it gave it a bit more of that uh, you gotta stick to your particular role kind of flavor. Um, both work great in their own ways. Uh, personally, I 
On this one, I gotta lean on the Reborn side, though, because as much as I love stacking things for those really high recruit odds, it feels super dirty to walk in and be like, yeah, 81% recruit dodge, er, er, recruit on this uh, freaking skelly. <laughs> Like, you can walk into Farampa, you can walk into the center map, and just get all of these guys on your side. <laughs> the only reason the third guy isn't here, um, with a similar recruit chance uh, from a uh, Necromancer there, uh, is simply because they got knocked out. Uh, they got counterattacked and knocked out before he could be recruited. Um, I didn't realize how high those odds have remained. Yeah, they do scale off loyalty and stuff like that, but, like, that's pretty dang high. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Kind of feel like that could be lowered a little bit, but I have no idea how you'd do that. Um, uh, let's see, audio options. Just Reborn added a lot of audio options. That's what is what is there to say. Like right now, you'll notice nothing going on in the menu because there's specifically an option for if you want to leave it on AI, you can make it so that it only plays sounds when you're playing it itself. You can change the audio levels of the different effects, courtesy of the fact that they redid all of the effects. Um, elemental shields, uh, already kind of dis discussed that a little bit before. Reborn's case, they combined instill and an elemental shield. Uh, uh, One Vision's case, they combined a, uh, a general buff and an elemental shield. You know, let's see, different stuff there. Both have technical access to early zombies. Funnily enough, even on the same map. <laughs> That might be a total coincidence, but technically the first uh, zombie you can get a hold of, uh, you can get your first zombie in the uh, uh, the Nimith map in Reborn. You can get access to your first skeleton one map after the Nimith map in in One Vision. Um, they changed the oh yeah they changed the uh, the chess rule. Uh, this I don't think this had an official name, uh, but they changed uh, what I called the uh, the chess rule here, uh, where uh, the way the chariot works in back in uh, in. Reborn and PSP there, is that if you back out while it's still your current turn, uh, it won't actually penalize you, uh, it won't count as a chariot usage. If you do that in Reborn, it will. Now, I think this actually carries over to the uh, to the accuracy discussion uh, between the two. Uh, basically, in both PSP and One Vision, the accuracy rates are very, very low, and especially you might have noticed during that fight earlier, there was a lot of stuff that was missing because they, had, they added a kind of uh, weather season system in this one. Well, in all three versions, frankly. Um, so there's going to be those moments where the weather is just completely against you. You've built somebody for accuracy, but your odds are still phenomenally low. You don't want to spend the time to go increase their accuracy. So like in uh, in One Vision's case, we're basically fighting against the rain more than we're actually fighting against these units. We're still going to win. It's just going to be more annoying. Uh, and so you can do those things where you can just back out of the turn, attack them from a different angle, and then, you know, bing, bang, boom, you hit anyway. Don't worry, don't feel bad, we've all done it. It gets annoying sometimes when you, there's 98% chance and they miss, and you're like, you know what, fuck you, I hit that. <laughs> but uh, either way, like, everyone's done it. Now, the way that they redid this for Reborn was that everything pretty much has 100% hit odds most of the time. Now, you might say that this took out accuracy entirely. It did not. So, the interesting thing here is that it, it changed it so that you are basically always going to hit your uh, your attacks, but on the AI side, you can do things like turn on dodge, you can turn on uh, weather, you can take advantage of bad accuracy tiles, to the point where you're always hitting, they aren't. Um, and this is, this is something that's really fun to play around with if you give it a shot. Like, build for avoidance, uh, use your avoidance items, go and take advantage of low accuracy tiles, Use a uh, Savage Bugle, which frankly no one's ever freaking used a Savage Bugle in their life through this entire series until Reborn, I guarantee it. Uh, and and yeah, you'll start noticing those, uh, those moments where it's like, hey, I can dodge like absolutely crazy, they can't do a thing to stop this. Um, so that's practically essential for doing a solo of Reborn, which we'll be doing some of that pretty soonish. Um, but anyway... Um, that's... I just wanted to throw that out there in terms of why is the accuracy there? It's an anti-frustration feature. Uh, the, uh, like, why do wizards not cast Paralytic Wave all the time? It's an anti-frustration feature. Because for... for us long-timers that are used to it, yeah, we're fine with dealing with the, you know, old RPG type of stuff of absolutely no shots are landing and everything sucks and it's being miserable and everything else. We're used to that, we live it, we like it, okay? For trying to get anybody into the series, you want to let their shots land. <laughs> this is why you saw so many more players, uh, you know, getting into strategy games from something like, you know, uh, the, the friggin' Mario Kingdom battle than you did from XCOM 2. Like, yeah, XCOM 2 was objectively the better game there, but like, 
you know, you gotta you gotta have that. Now, what if you had that uh, that trade off without actually having a better game or worse game type of argument attached to it? Um, anyway, anyway, point being, guaranteed things are something that are definitely more of a trend in uh, in games at this point, and it's for good reason. It, like, no one likes to have their turn mean nothing. Uh, so if if effectively every action has a good reaction, no matter what you're doing, and you lost simply because you played wrong, it feels a lot more satisfying to most. Um, anyway, so, okay. Uh, let's see, we got that. We've got the changes to Angel Knights and Liches. We've got different changes in body snatches and Snapdragon mechanics. Uh, power gating of, power of levels. Okay, leveled categories versus level cap. Uh, both of these versions have a level cap. I, I, I see the comment... I would say probably every three days or so at this point, um, of, uh, like, oh, level caps are reducing everything. This is the only version that did that. Did that. Every version of this game had a level cap. Uh, you had the gear cap in PSP and One Vision. Uh, you basically just... Well, I guess you could grind infinitely in the uh, SNES version. Uh, the level cap there was measured in your sanity. Um, and then the... Uh, yeah, the level cap was a bit more obvious in terms of the union cap. However, you got access to equipment, which frankly was more overpowered anyway, so realistically... Like, if you abused elements, you abused debuffs, you abused your equipment, you can get just as overpowered in Reborn as you could in previous versions. It's not anything actually holding you back. Sounds to me like an excuse, but uh, anyway. Um, let's see, movement items... Random quality of life stuff. Shoot, we forgot to go to the quality of life stuff. Look, that stuff's just very apparent. We've lightly touched on it, but it's mostly apparent. Anyway, I'm completely out of time here. That was the hour that I had. So, well, technically it's like an hour separated over two separate days. But you get you get the idea. Um, so that's about that. I hope, I hope this helped to, I guess, explain a few things in terms of why this topic is just kind of, uh, kind of confusing in general. Like, it's... It's difficult to necessarily say one feature is better than the other. These are games that are designed to be played as a roleplay rule set, and they both do their job well. Uh, so they both approached many, uh, many similar things in kind of completely different directions. Both directions were correct, so just switch between them as you feel fit. All right. So that's about that. I gotta get going. Y'all have yourselves a good one, and thank you for sticking by this uh, rambling madness. All right. Take care. See you in the next one.